Well, here I am in James 1.26 this morning, bridle your tongue. That'll be interesting, won't it? Bridle your tongue. And here's what James says, if anyone thinks himself. That's hard to get people to do this about it. They're quick to tell you about other people's. <laughs> Slow about doing anything to their own. So pay attention to how he, he addresses this. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, actually in the Greek it says his own tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is vain or worthless. Notice that was a subject that he talks about in verse 26, 27, vain versus pure religion, which we've already discussed with you. So we're going to talk about bridling his tongue and what he has to say about this today uh, will be of interest to us, I hope. And notice this is self-reflection. This is not talking about other people's loose tongue, right? Well, wait. <laughs> if anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet not does not bridle what? His own tongue. Uh, not talking about how other people's tongue wa wag. Uh, talking about how ours does. So that's, that's where our interest is today on this subject matter when it says bridle your own tongue. Uh, and we'll get into our study after this word of prayer. Okay? And listen, remember, I was sitting there. We've prayed for Mrs. White for years. As soon as we knew she was diagnosed, we've been in her journey a long, a long time as a church through Jackie's prayers as a neighbor. And, uh, you know, Paul says to be absent of bodies, to be present with the Lord. But I'm going to tell you what I think that I learned from Paul when he went. I, I, I think what you're, what you're going to be wonderfully surprised with is to be absent from one family is to be present with another one. I think you're going to, you're going to understand to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. But I think what you're going to understand, you're going to leave one family to be joined to another. And, and that's going to be quite a day. I mean, you know, everybody's interested today in ancestry, where we came from and all that. Listen, when you get to heaven and you look, you're going to see the people that you knew the closest. Then you're going to see a whole ancestry that goes way back to Adam. That's going to be an amazing deal. To be absent from one family is to be present with another is what I'd like to think about this morning in regard to the White family and especially Mrs. White because she got the thrill of her life at 3 o'clock this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the things our heart has felt. Even as we heard people's prayers, I lift before you Tony Butler today out working with Jeff's church, the Liberty Church. I lift Je Jeff before you. He has a lot of health issues. Deborah Smith. Steve Chafin. Claudia, pray for Don's mama. Give her a good passing, a promotion, we call it. Pray for Benjamin today, Father. What a great report my heart felt the other day with Benjamin. We called him Benny. What a wonderful thing. We thank you, Father, for the privilege we have as a believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ to be able to confess our sins and be restored to spirituality by the confession of sin, whether it be mental attitude sins or sins of the tongue, as we will be talking about, or overt sins. The grace of God has taken up our slack. The grace of God has taken up our slack 
in our inability or, or our lack of desire to walk the walk. And yet, what a wonderful recovery system it is by grace to confess our sin and be restored as if it never occurred. Your sins I remember no more. Your sins I remember no more. Thank you, Jesus, for the price you paid to give us that promise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week, you were, or the last time I spoke to you, I guess, that, was that last week? Gosh, it seems like I've been gone forever. Gosh. Uh, last week, we talked about vain versus pure religion. We looked at, from a world standpoint, we talked about the 11 world religions. And, and in Paul's day, he, he had three, three primary religions of the 11. There were three that were primary. Uh, one, uh, they don't even talk about today, the, the Roman Greco religion of the world, paganism. It came from so many other different ones of idolatry. He fought that one, called it the Gentile religion, and it, it pretty much the Greco-Romans. You know, it's pretty interesting. That's it. For Kirk, he would understand the influence. Not only were they a, 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 a fighting machine, uh, both those nations, but tactfully, the way they conquered nations wasn't really by force. It was by intellect. And they still are doing it today. I mean, if you look at our our political system and a lot of things we do and the way we think about, you will see that enormous influence even in Western civilization that comes out of the Greco-Roman civilizational ideas. That's pretty amazing to me. It's pretty amazing to me. And listen, America somehow or another discovered this, and that's the way we do it. It's the way we used to do it. The way we used to do it is we would conquer people and send missionaries. And they would influence people with righteous thinking and biblical solid principles. And then you, the results would be places like Japan and places like that that's just done enormously because of the way and our influence. We've conquered people with a different way of influence. We still send missionaries around the world. And the missionaries go down there with the gospel and begin to teach the word of God. The culture changes. Christianity is a pretty powerful thing. And well, Paul, he, he fought the Greco-Roman culture of pagan religion. Then he fought Judaism and legalism. And he fought the church like he's doing here today with James and other guys trying to bring the church out of one area like James. You can see how James struggles with the law versus grace in this book. One of the early books that was written was written by James, who was still struggling trying to get a hold of grace. He writes this book and later goes to, listen to me now, he writes this book, apparently, then later goes, to, a couple of years later, goes to the Jerusalem uh, church conference, and his life is changed by the doctrine of grace taught by Paul and Barnabas. Hmm? You can see it in this writing, and I'll show it to you today. It's in the whole book. You can see that the missing link in all of this is grace. The missing link in the whole book of James, and that's why a lot of, a lot of theologians stay away from this book because it has a twinge of legalism in it and, and nothing of grace. Now, you can find it in here, but I'm going to show you some things that shows you the struggle James is having when he writes this book. Okay? Here's our text for today, and I want you to look at that. I'm, I want to point out a few things to you. For example, it starts, the word if is a first-class condition. Listen to me. It means it's true. If it's true in the if, then it's true in the then. If then, you know, if yada yada, then yada yada. Are you with me? Okay. 
I've got to separate it because you may not know when the then comes. So I want to separate it. So I want to read it to you. I'm going to give you the if. If the if is true, the then is true. Are you, are, you got that? He, okay, now watch this. Hey, um, well, I'm thinking about because I forget my mind span of like that. Gene, see me at halftime, will you, in case I forget. If anyone, that's an indefinite pronoun, anyone, I mean anyone, I don't care who you are, big, little, small, great, poor, whatever. If anyone, that, it's, uh, uh, right, it don't matter who it is. I don't care if it's a pastor, I don't care if it's a deacon, I don't care. If, if anyone thinks, dokeo, present active addictive, that's a main verb, pay attention to that. That's a main verb. Put MV down. That's a main verb. Now, I'm going to tell you why it's important. God got two present participles. It's going to make up the bulk of the, what he's teaching. That's a main verb. The main verb is the engine that runs the car in the Greek language. It is in English as well, by the way. If anyone thinks, I'm going to come back to that word, dokeo, present active indicative, main verb, third person singular, himself, I got a line through it because it's not in the Greek language. If anyone thinks to be, I mean, absolute status quo verb, present active infinitive of religion, to him be religious, and yet it's not there, understood, does not, negative may, and does not, the idea is, does not bridle his own tongue, pay attention to his own, See, I gave you that demonstrative pronoun, his own tongue, but... This is adjunctive conjunction that goes with the main verb of participles. Pay attention to me now. But deceives. Who's he deceiving? Who's he deceiving? Himself. And is connected to what? The main verb is what? The main verb is what in English? Thinks. His thinking has caused him to deceive himself. You understand that? You understand Adam and Eve in the garden with the serpent? I wish I could just cause you to understand how dangerous this idea is to the Christian life. Self-deception. Nobody fooling him. Who's he fooling? Himself. Nobody's fooling him. He's fooling himself. This is the danger of the Christian church. You'll get yourself in more trouble over this than any other thing. Okay. Remember, what is the main verb in the English? What's the main verb? Think. And the way this person is thinking is self-deceiving. He's deceiving himself. Agreed? There's so, that, you know what we call it? Listen to me. We begin by calling this idea of self-deception, we call it subjectivity when you should be objective. Right? Now, what lies behind subjectivity when it's obvious you should, should be objective is distorted thinking. We call, it, we call that old man cosmos diabolical thing. Something's inner. Something is staticky in the way you're thinking. Something's interfering with your thinking. Are you with, with me? Therefore, it has to be thought patterns going on. There's a conflict in, in what you're thinking. And what is, being, what is in conflict is divine viewpoint versus human viewpoint or cosmic viewpoint, worldly viewpoint. Are you with me? There's your bugger boo, as we say. I don't know who we are, but whoever says that. There's your bugger boo. Now watch. If anyone thinks himself to be religious does not bridle, 
I'm going to come back to that word, his own tongue, his religion is worthless. This man, and that, oh, it does not bring that, but deceives his own heart. Then, now we got to then. All of, all of that first part of that is all part of the if. Then this man that I just dis, d explained to you, then this man's religion is what? Empty. The word vain, worthless means empty. Empty of what? Reality. Of substance. Is, is, has lost the reality of substance of his faith. One verse. What's your main verb? Think. Now pay attention. I'm going to show you the two participles. I'll show you two participles that work in conjunction with the main verb. What's the main verb? Think. Thinking. Think. Here they are. Does not bridle his tongue. See that? It's a present active participle. The way he's thinking is deceiving himself from bridling his tongue. He thinks he's justified in not bridling it. Whatever, whatever that motivation is from distorted thinking, it's, it's from not paying attention to what the Word of God says. It's in conflict. Now watch this. There's first participle that's connected. To maybe what? It's a present participle that's connected with the present indicative. In other words, these two things are occurring at the same time, running on their own. You understand? The subjective. That now we understand that what he's talking about is subjective thinking, where the word of God is in conflict with another viewpoint. I've got my, I don't care what the Bible, I've heard this, I don't care what the Bible says. I ain't doing it. Uh, hope you got good insurance. That's what I tell them. You're going to need it. Go, Father, put you under discipline. A good parent would do that, wouldn't he? To what? To rescue him from himself. There's a first participle that's in conjunction with the way he thinks and does not bridle his tongue. Does not bridle his own tongue. Second pr present participle deceives his own what? See, when he's talking about a tongue, he's talking about one thing, and when he's talking about a heart, he's talking about the other, and the heart's being operated by the way he's thinking, and he's in self-deception of his heart. What is, he's doing this to himself. Because God wants him to bridle his tongue, and he won't bridle it. He won't control it. He wants his tongue to be under control. But you see, what controls it is his heart, and his heart is self-deceived to let his tongue run. Do you understand that? I got two present participles that work off the main verb. This man thinks himself to be religious, will not bridle his tongue, has deceived his heart. This man's religion is empty. Doesn't mean he don't have the truth. His heart wouldn't be in conflict without it. Unbelievers don't have conflicts like this. Oh, the Bible says, oh, I better worry about that. I never gave the Bible, I didn't. Even... When I was an unbeliever, the last thing I cared about was what the Bible said. Apparently, you got saved really early in your life, but I didn't, so... 
Now, let's go back to this word bridle. I want to show you something. Let's go back to the word bridle. It's a compound word. In the Greek, it's a compound word, the word bridle. Now, I don't know what bridle means to you, but I'm going to explain it. Because it's a way where it won't bridle his tongue. It's made up of two Greek words. See the first word, C-H-A-L, C-H-A-L-I-N. And then if you add an O-S, that's one word. And this is a, a word that means you, you have a, you've probably seen this on a on farm or some, some kind of farm channel. You, you have a loop and a, and a halter cord that fits over the head and of the jaw of an animal. Just a rope. And, and the other part of this word is A-G-O. The second word is A-G-O, and it means to lead. And so you, uh, you put this halter on a rope. It's a rope halter type of thing, and it fits down over the jaw, right? right. And, you, and you can lead them. Do you know who you can... Do you know what animal you can do that with? One who's been trained with a bit in their mouth to be controlled. You can't do that with a young calf that's never been trained. You put that on it, that calf will beat you to death. That year old calf that's never had any of that on them, they've got a free spirit. They'll kick you all over the place. Once you train them with a bit in their mouth, you know what the bit's for? To restrain. How much a horse weigh? 5,000 pounds? 4,000 4, pounds? I don't know. Weighs more than I do. I got on a horse one time. My grandfather told me, go get the horse. I went out. I thought I'd ride him back without a bridle, held on to his mane. And he took me to God only knows where. And when he got, th got through with me, he threw me off. Never, never would do that again. Because you can't. That mane doesn't control him. Bit in his mouth. You can say, whoa, and he woes. And if he doesn't, you pull back on him, he woes right away. Now, I tell you that because here we have somebody that knows better, and we're putting somebody that's been trained to know better. We, put a, we can put something as simple as a rope form around him and can lead him. When James comes to the third chapter and talks about this again, in the third chapter, we're coming back and talk about this again. In the third chapter, verse 3, he talks about a bit in the mouth to restrain him. And listen, God knows how to put a bit in your mouth to get you to do what he wants you to do. He'll put a bit in your mouth. But where, what he would like to do is to have you easily led. But here's a person who knows better, been trained by God to know better, that will not bridle his tongue. And what God is going to have to do, he's going to have to put him into James 3, 3. He's going to have to put him back. Now, he shouldn't. This is a horse that should not have to have a bit put back in his mouth to lead him from one stall to another. When we get, but we got a problem with them. We got a problem with them, haven't we? We got a problem with them. Because he won't bridle his what? Himself. He won't bridle himself. Won't bridle himself. He won't bridle his own tongue. He's into self-deception, so you got to go back to discipline. You got to go back and put the bit in his mouth. You got to train him again. 
You got to conditional, tra conditionally train them again. And so it is with God and you and I. The tongue. Who would have ever thought of all the members of your body? The tongue. He's talking about your tongue. And your heart. And they're connected. To do the right thing or the wrong thing. And so there is your lesson for the day. You got two participles working off the main verb. And it's all about the way you think with your heart. Towards the thing God tells you to do. You should be, you've got enough growth and stability and, di and discipline of the Father in your life to be able to be harnessed easily and led simply. But you've deceived your own heart. You will not bridle your tongue. Now, here's the problem with this. Listen to me. This is the problem with the book of James for guys like me. They present a great picture of the problem and don't tell you how to solve it. That's the problem with many pulpits of America today. They lay out a great sermon on the problem. I mean, excellent sermons on the problem and don't tell you how to fix it. And if they do, it's nebulous. It doesn't, it doesn't fit the occasion. They'll say, okay, you need to get saved or you just need to maybe simply as simple as say you need to confess your sin. And listen, that won't fix this. It will not fix this problem because it's a problem of the what? Problem of the heart. And the way the heart is thinking manifested in behavior won't fix it. And so James doesn't fix it. He does not fix it in this whole book. He does not fix it. He presents a wonderful problem and then gives you no spiritual solution. So my job, as I take you through the book of James, is to tell you the spiritual solutions because he didn't. I can't, I can't settle for that. I could leave this whole day and you'd say, well, I know, I should bridle my tongue, eh, eh, eh. but you can't do it can't do it, especially when it comes from your heart because a heart has established a pattern under conditions, patterns and conditions, so that you do, you do the same old, the same old, and sometimes you can control it, willpower, and sometimes you can't because of pressure. You flip out because willpower can't do this. James leaves you with the idea that you should bridle your own tongue, right? The problem is you can't do that when the heart is not on, in tune with the word of God and you can't do it in the flesh no matter what. So I'm going to tell you how to do this. James, like many pastor teachers, do a great job of explaining the fleshly problem but not the spiritual solution. For example, in our lesson text, James lays out the fleshly problem of the sin of the tongue and leaves a believer with how to conquer it. James says you are responsible to control your own tongue. He suggests to bridle it. What in effect does that mean? Especially when you understand and interpret the word for bridle. So I want to talk about four things on spiritually bridling your tongue. I'm going to tell you how to do it, and I'm going to tell you right now, you can't do it with the natural power. You can't do it by willpower. You can't do Oh, you can do it a little bit. Listen, when he tells you to bridle your tongue, he's talking about 100% every time, every place, every situation and pattern. You understand that? You, there's no way you can bridle your tongue under willpower 100% all the time. All right, do you understand that? There's no way. I don't get, the willpower don't have that kind of power. The willpower cannot control the activity of the sin nature. The only thing that can control it is Galatians 5.16. You must walk in the power of the Holy Spirit who indwells you. In other words, you need not natural power. 
listen to me now, you need supernatural power. Isn't that an interesting word? Supernatural power. That's you in the flesh understanding that the only thing that control a problem of sin in your life is the Holy Spirit functioning in your life by the filling, walking it out ministry. You understand that? You will when the day is over, if I got enough time. James leaves us with self-control problem over the sin of the tongue. This passage, this believer in this passage, thinks himself to be religious and is now told, listen, this is what wrinkles me. The, the reason I have the ministry I have in this pulpit, in this city, is because guys like this. James leaves you without any hope. He leaves you in despair. And these are the guys I sat under, until I met Bob Thame, these are the guys I sat under that left me frustrated. They presented my problem, never gave me a solution, never gave me mechanics how to fix it. And I was always torn up about it. He's told to bridle his tongue. When he can't, he's told that his religion is worthless. Or when it doesn't work, then you're told your faith isn't sufficient. Which is just piling on. It doesn't solve anything. It doesn't solve a thing. It doesn't. Willpower doesn't work 100% of 100% of the time. The only thing that works 100% of 100% of the time is the ministry of the Holy Spirit over the flesh. The, if you have a sin problem, you have a flesh problem. If you have a flesh problem as a believer, you're either a baby believer or an immature believer or a mature believer that is deceiving himself because the absolute power over your flesh is only one thing and God gave it to you. It's a supernatural power. It's the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit of God. It is time you quit going to church, being beat up, and left. We're going to tell you how to fix it. Tell you to bridle your tongue, and you can't. And so then he tells you. Then they come back and tell you your religion is worthless. What James could have explained, what James could have explained, was how to access the supernatural power over the sin nature by walking by means of the end. Look at Galatians 5, 16, 17. It's clear as a bell, walk, which is a command. Walk by means of the Holy Spirit indwelling you, and you will not, listen to that promise, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. But you got to do what? You got to obey the command. What's the command? Obey. So how do you do it? Well, when something comes up in your life, and your mind begins to go one way and the other. And the Spirit of God says, walk in the Spirit, don't walk in the flesh, because you know what that pattern's like in your life, right? We all know what it means to walk in the flesh. If you're over three years old, you know this. So when it comes up and it says, don't go there, don't go there, don't go there, then don't go there. Go where? Go to the Holy Spirit. Inner dialogue. It's all about inner dialogue. When that comes up and your flesh goes, Whoa, you go, shut it down. Shut the flesh down. You have the power, willpower to shut it down. Then open up to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Shut it down. Go, go flesh because you got a history of going to flesh. Well, I'm going to have my two cents. Now I'll pull the two cents back and get a nickel over here. Why use two cents when he'll give you a nickel? You don't have to take two cents. Nobody wants your two cents. God will give you a nickel. Go over here and be on the plus side, not on the negative side. When you go over here, the two cents, where's the negative side? Go over here to the plus side where he'll give you a nickel. Give you a solution. And so this is how this simply works. Galatians 5, 6, 5 16, 70. Walk, a present imperative. Walk by means of the power of the Holy Spirit. You will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. That's a promise. 
It's a promise based on the supernatural power. Listen, you, don't, you know how you got the Holy Spirit? You believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and raised from the dead the third day. You got the Holy Spirit of God. Galatians 3, 2. How did you receive the Holy Spirit? How did your Christian life begin? It began with the Holy Spirit. How did you get it? I got it by faith in the gospel. Galatians 3, 2. When does he leave you? John 14, 16. Never. The Holy Spirit comes in. He's not permitted to ever leave you. The rest of us may, but he can't. He can't. 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, 1 through 3 say, be careful that you walk in the Spirit because if, when you're, listen to me now, when you're never neutral. A after you get saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's never a time in your life when you're neutral. You're either carnal or spiritual. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Evidence of, spiritu of spirituality is the fruit of the Spirit. Evidence! Show me evidence, Ron Adama. Show me evidence. I can. I can show you evidence. Carnality is personal sin. Spirituality is fruit of the Spirit in your life. Produced how? Supernaturally. You know how sin is produced? Willfully. Naturally. You got to learn how to live in the supernatural life, not in the natural life. The natural life has got you to be a slug. I'm talking about the animal kingdom now. So, this works 100%. Walking in the power of the Holy Spirit works 100% of the 100% of the time. You know why? Because it's God that does it. God, the Holy Spirit, works 100%, 100% of the time. Now, the person wrote that down. I wrote it down. I want to remember that. Did you circle it? You ought to do something with it. Because that's a mind-boggling, isn't it? A hundred percent of the hundred percent of the time? What kind of a deal is that? I tell you, the world can't ever give you that. That's called grace, people. That's called grace. You want to know how to define grace? There it is. Just think about that. When you turn to the power of the Holy Spirit, he, he works supernaturally a hundred percent of the hundred percent of the time. 100%. Uh, hey. Who wouldn't take that deal? Here's the second point. These believers talked about in James' text. These believers need to be told that, whoa, 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 watch this. You know what the problem over here is? His problem over here, James' problem over here is self-control. What James says, he says, bridle your own tongue. The problem is he can't do it. He got a problem with self-control. The whole thing of the bridle and everything, you know. Come on now. Don't make me work this hard. I've only been gone a week. Dave, you think I've been gone a month. These believers need to be told that one of the nine fruit of the indwelling Holy Spirit is supernatural, listen to me, is supernatural spiritual self-control. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians. I'm not going to get through with all this anyhow today. Are you in Galatians 5, 22, 23, the fruit of the Spirit? Do you see that? Well, I, I want everybody's eye on this. This is the point. This is the whole point here. If you don't have a Bible, there's one on the pew. Look in the front of it. You can't find Galatians. Look in the front. It's got an index. It'll give you a page number. Turn to it. Turn to chapter 5. Look at verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit. There are nine listed. Are you with me? There are nine listed. Do you see the nine listed? Well, just count them in your head. One, two, three, four. There are nine, right? <laughs> okay. There's nine, right? There's nine. Watch this now. Watch this. What's the first one? Love. Now, you know James is going to put that first. Don't, I mean, uh, Paul is going to put that first, right? Because for, for him, 1 Corinthians 13, 13, what's the greatest? Love, right? So you know he's going to put that. What's the last word of the nine? What's the last fruit of the nine? 
<laughs> Self-control or temperance. If you have a King James Bible, they call it temperance. He's talking about the same thing, self-control or temperance. Self-control. Now listen, is, that's a fruit of what? Fruit of the what? Spirit. Holy Spirit. That is the Holy Spirit who indwells your body, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20, who indwells your body and is there to produce fruit. Fruit. You know how it's produced? By him, supernaturally, spiritually, the first one was love and the last one was what? Self-control. You see, James, what you need to tell the people, because we live in the new covenant age. We don't live in the old covenant age, James. I know you were raised in it. You were taught all your life the old covenant. But, James, we live in the new covenant. You've got to tell the people. You've got to tell the people that we live under a new covenant. We live under the covenant of grace, James. And we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. And James, there's a fruit that takes care of this very problem. You've got to tell the people it's supernaturally produced as a spiritual from God. And it's called, James, self-control. Tell the people they can't bridle their tongue in the power of the Spirit and be honoring to God, but they can by the Holy Spirit. How are you going to brighten your tongue today, people? By the supernatural power of the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. I could sit here all day long and tell you, bridle your tongue, bridle your tongue. When enough pressure came to your life, the last thing you do, bridle your tongue until it was out and swept, swept half the church away. Then you bridle your tongue when all the damage has been done. You don't have to do all that. Right there. Not willpower, right? It's not, by, it's not the natural. It's not natural. Not the, not the natural power. Not the willpower. It's the Holy Spirit power. It's the Holy Spirit power. Holy Spirit power, people. This is not brain surgery here. This is just, this is one-on-one. -on -one. James is going to come back in the third chapter, and he's going to whack you again. He's going to tell you, yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm going to have to tell you how to, how to make the yeah, yeah work. And what a privilege that is in my life. Now, I want you to listen to me closely because I can't get to any more points today. Listen to me now. This is what makes our ministry in this church different than all the other churches out there today. You got to pay attention to me. I know you get to thinking that we're like everybody else, and we're not. This is what makes this ministry a ministry of hope, of confidence, that we can be conquerors of anything, especially in our own life. And it's not difficult to do. It's supernatural. God, don't leave it up to you to fix it. You've got to learn to leave it up to him to do it. And here's one way he can do it. Bridle your tongue. Control your tongue. You know how it's done? As a fruit ministry of the Holy Spirit of God in your life. Stop going to your flesh. Go to the Spirit of God who lives within you. And let him solve this in your life. We shouldn't be fighting each other with our tongues, should we? We shouldn't be doing that. Well, as far as I can get today, because I've ran out of time. Maybe I'll come back. Maybe I won't. We'll just see. I gave, wrote it down. But I certainly gave you what God wanted you to hear today in the first hour. In the second hour, we have the Eucharist. It's good to be home. You're a wonderful group of people to teach. We should have more people. And let me tell you, don't think they're not. Listen, I've heard, 
I've heard a buzz in the church that says, I don't think people are interested in doctrine. I can tell you that's not true. Everywhere I stopped, hotels, restaurants, Chick-fil-A and Christianburg went every morning and said hello. Greetings from Birmingham, Alabama, Chick-fil-A. Churches and people. The lady who come to the house and cut my hair. Who heard of that anymore? I got hope that doctors actually might do that one day. Get a lady to come and cut my hair. I found people hungry, hungry for the truth of God's word. I found them hungry. I found them at the register of hotels. I found them, I found them bringing the food to my table, Jane, at my table. I found them at Chick-fil-A, the guy sitting next to me saying, what, what are you reading? What are you so involved in? I said, come over here and sit with me a minute. And I told them how Christ had changed my life. How Christ had changed my life. And put me on a whole different course for my life. And he said, I wonder if he'd do that for me. I said, boy, this is your day. I mean, this is your day, buddy. If he'd do it for a guy like me, he'd do it for anybody. Then John will love this. I hooked him up to our website. Listen, go get this stuff. Father, we're so thankful. We are so thankful today. Maybe we just have to invite people. Maybe we just have to talk to people. Maybe we just have to bring them in. Maybe we need to be more friendly. I don't know. I found being a good friend with people, being friendly with them, smiling with them early in the morning at least, or late at night. I found people out there stressed with all kinds of stuff and just being cheerful with them, put a smile on their face. You know, we hear people in the South talk about have a blessed day. Man, in Christ. In Christ. Uh, take this offering, Father, we're about to present to you. Give us the wisdom to use it in a way that reaches the most at the critical time in their life to bring them to a dependence on God Almighty for all of their needs to be met in Jesus Christ, in whose name we prayed. Amen.